All right. So thank you very much for the for the opportunity, uh, for the invitation, and also for organizing this very nice meeting. Um, I'm just a bit sad that I'm not there because I would rather like to discuss all these things with you over a nice cup of filter coffee than sharing slides of a screen when I'm sitting in the morning and you are sitting there in the afternoon and the whole thing is a bit upside down. But but we'll make the best of it. Um, and uh, we'll see how things go. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> so what I'm going to present here today is in fact, a uh, sort of combination of two very different kinds of uh, investigations or different kinds of studies with the common thought of uh, what can we do going forward in the regime of high luminosity and let's see uh, in terms of uh, sort of you know looking for supersymmetric signatures. Uh, so, th so this is a work that I'm uh, doing uh, in collaboration with a lot of people from IISC, who are, um, all of them are in India, except Rahul, who uh, recently went to the US for his postdoc. Uh, the project, all, all these things that I'm talking about are also a part of uh, a bilateral uh, funding that we received from the Austrian agency OEAD and the DST of uh, India uh, side. Uh, so just to put, put it out there, there are also nice opportunities where we have possibilities of establishing collaborations across institutes, which is quite nice uh, to keep in mind. Okay, very good. So since I was giving this talk uh, specifically in India, right, and I, I, th I thought this is something that uh, the audience here will appreciate. So every time I was thinking about Susie and why we should do supersymmetric searches and stuff. This particular, you know, translation of a very famous Hindi song comes to my mind, right? So if you read the translation, I think you would know what I'm talking about, right? So this is a very well-known song from movie Sangam. And if you sort of do a supersymmetric version of it, what I would sort of do is something like this, right? So don't get upset by reading this letter of mine. This is a letter that I'm writing to supersymmetry and I'm saying, I just wanted to say that you're worth searching for. Uh, I would call you elegant, but LHC is telling me otherwise, I would call you natural, that is too subjective. So I would just say that you are worth searching for, right? And this is basically the, the philosophy that I'm following in the investigation of supersymmetric analysis or parameter space in general, because it, it still remains to be one of the theories that gives us very nice benchmarks to divide parameter space in different signatures and uh, to sort of give us a guideline for looking for different kinds of things at the LHC, right? So Susie in itself is a very big topic. I'm not going to cover a, a, a huge parameter space at all. I'm going to very specifically concentrate on supersymmetric scenarios where R parity is conserved. In other words, the LSP is a stable particle. Uh, I will talk about um, two, let's say, um, different um, uh, strategies, if you wish. One, so primary search strategies for MSSM, or well, let me put it this way. I'll talk about two primary different uh, search strategies that I said, but to contrast that sort of with, with, the, with the philosophy that I'm going with, we should keep in mind or we should look at how we've been doing MSSM searches at the LHC. Right? So our primary search strategy so far, not a part of this talk, but so far, has been to deal with MSSM as a benchmark scenario with st using standard model mediators as production mechanisms uh, and in simplified model searches. Right? And if you look at this and the corresponding simplified models that we have looked at, this has mostly led to prompt final states uh, with an exception of long lived. So that is what we've been doing. We have been using MSSM as a benchmark model. We've primarily been concentrating on prompt final states. We've been using standard model as a production mechanism or, or a mediator uh, to produce our supersymmetric final states that we are interested in, okay? Uh, the exceptions for long lived, uh, for prompt final states have been, for example, long lived Chaujinos, where we've made a lot of progress. Uh, and gravity no LSP, for example, which also typically leads to long-lived particles and LSPs in particular. So in this talk, I'll basically have two alternative thoughts, right? One is what if the production of supersymmetry particle happens via non-standard mediators rather than standard model Ws and the Zs and the Higgs and the whole thing that we have been studying? 
Uh, and in particular, I'm interested in looking at new resonances uh, like heavy Higgs's, uh, and I'll exemplify that in the context of minimal supersymmetric standard model. Okay, and the other thing that I'm that I would like to sort of ponder upon briefly is: is there a possibility to get long-lived neutral particles in the context of supersymmetric scenarios? And how can we go looking for them? Okay, and in this case, I look at NMSSM as a case study. So extension of the minimal supersymmetric standard model by means of uh, uh, some singlet scenarios. Okay, throughout this talk, I will not concentrate on dark matter aspects, uh, although we will uh, we have taken into account um, direct indirect detection constraints. One thing we've never done. Uh, uh, in throughout this talk is to care about relic density generation, that is whether it obeys the relic density of the universe or not. Uh, and it has an advantage that at the LHC, we can really prove uh, the, 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 the dark matter properties without caring about the relic density. And I think we should exploit them. And we should sort of use this capability of the collider to probe alternative histories of the universe or to probe multi-component dark matter scenarios and so on and so forth. So restricting ourselves to relic density might actually be a little bit more harmful than useful in that context. Okay, good. So with this brief sort of introduction, I'm sorry for the technical glitch again, I'll go directly to the first part of the, of the um, two-prong uh, strategy that I wanted to talk about here. One, the, so the first one being production of supersymmetric particles via heavy Higgs. Okay, so this was a work that was done, as I said, with a, a, a whole lot of nice people from, from IISC, and I've been working with them for, for years now, uh, and I've given you the archive reference there. So the whole thought of um, looking into this um, prospect has actually been a, a long investigation in, in, from our side, uh, started in 2015 or so, so to say. And uh, what we observed at the time, uh, when we were looking at, uh, at uh, light stops, in fact, was that if you look at the parameter space of the heavy Higgs, which is what you see on the slide, uh, on, the, on, the, on the left hand side, you have the cross section of the Higgs to tau tau final state, heavy Higgs to tau tau final state at 14 TV. And I take, uh, so the cross, whenever the cross section hits one femta one or so, I take that contour and I lay it on the plot on the right hand side, where I show you the cross section of the Higgs decaying to supersymmetric final states, in particular to the electroweak emails. Right. So you see where the Higgs to standard model final state, Higgs to tau tau in particular, falls below some threshold of a few femtobarns or so, you actually start to pick up Higgs to supersymmetric final states cross section with a rather large uh, signal strength or, or a rather large sigma times branching ratio. And therefore, it becomes interesting to, to, to look into this channel, not only because uh, it is an alternative search strategy, but also because it is a place where naturally heavy Higgs to standard model final states start to weaken in order to probe the parameter space of the heavy Higgs. Okay. So we said, okay, let's look into this final state and let's check what comes out of the decays of such supersymmetric particles. That is what kind of final states you can actually look at at the LHC. Okay. Uh, so this was something that we did later on. Uh, what you see here on the slide is on the, the two plots with uh, again heavy Higgs tan beta parameter space. On the left hand side you have it in the Beno like LSP scenarios. On the right hand side you have it in the Higgsino like LSP scenario. Uh, the the different color codes and the uh, and the details of the plot is not so much important. What is important are the legends which basically tell you that you get something like a mono Higgs final state, okay? You get decays of this heavy Higgs to neutralinos and charginos, and the decays of the charginos that lead to something like an invisible uh, final state on one leg and the Z plus a visible final state on the other egg or uh, invisible plus Higgs and so on and so forth, which basically tells you that we have a mono Higgs or mono X like scenarios, which lead uh, out of the Higgs decays to supersymmetric final states. 
Okay, so this is all quite good because we A, we do have some searches for uh, mono X scenarios. However, those searches don't necessarily exploit the resonances in between. But because we are looking at heavy Higgses, we also have the possibility to probe quite a different production and decay modes and therefore have a lot of opportunities to look for them going forward at the high luminosity. So what kind of uh, Higgs production modes and decay modes are available? So here I show you characteristically what kind of things you can construct in a simplified model limit, so to say. At the top of the slide, the two plot, the two Feynman diagrams will show you the production mechanism. So, you know, you have the typical gluon gluon fusion, you also have the BBH production mechanisms. And then you can have different decay modes. Uh, in our paper, we consider two different decay modes. So you see the prompt, which is uh, on the bottom left of the slide. So you have the prompt final state where the Higgs decays to a neutralino one uh, and a neutralino two or a three. And on the right hand side, you have uh, what is called what we call as a Chargino longer final state, where the Higgs decays to a pair of Chargino one and a Chargino two, and the Chargino one can be a long lived particle in general. So I'll not talk about the long-lived Chargino in this particular uh, talk. I wanted to more focus on the probe. This is just a choice I made that has nothing, there is no particular deeper reasoning behind it, okay? Now, if you look at the prompt final state, which is the Higgs decays to neutralino one and neutralino two or three, the decays of neutralino two, three uh, to, will go to Z or the Higgs. And you will also have to first further consider the decays of the Z and the Higgs. So you, have, you get into many different final states like di lepton plus missing energy, BB bar plus missing energy, gamma gamma plus missing energy, and so on and so forth. So if you have two production mechanisms, gluon gluon fusion and BBH production, multiply that with three different decay modes, you get a total of six different final states for prompt decays. Uh, and we analyzed all six of them in the paper. Um, and uh, therefore, you you sort of uh, you get a sort of sort of total of twelve analysis out of it, uh, depending on how you count whether you have a neutralino two or a neutralino three in the uh, in the final states uh, in the production mechanism that you're looking for. Okay, so what is the if you want to do this analysis, then you first want to ask whether there is a hope of doing this analysis at the high let let's see. So one of the first things we did was to actually look at the yield, which is the total number of events uh, for different production modes and different decay modes at high luminosity LHC. So this is what you see on this slide. On the top row, you have the gluon gluon production mode that gives you either a Z and a missing energy final state, which is top left. On the top right, you have the gluon gluon production mode leading to a Higgs and a missing energy final state. At the bottom, you have then the corresponding scenarios, but for a, uh, for a bottom production, okay? The interesting thing is the difference between the gluon gluon fusion and the bottom production is that the bottom production is going to give you an, associate, an extra associated B-jet, and you can use this additional B-jet to actually design a better analysis, uh, which gives you an additional handle to actually discriminate between the signal and the background. What you also see if you compare the top row and the bottom row is that there is a very nice complementarity between the gluon gluon production and the bottom quark, bottom uh, sorry, or a BBH production mode uh, that probes different regions of the parameter space. So it's not necessarily that one is better than the other. It's just that one is different than the other and both of them ultimately give you interesting regions to look at. So the second thing you want to look at is what are the signal and the background modes of the, of the uh, channels that you're interested in, okay? So here on this slide, I show you on the right, on the left-hand side, I show you the signal. So you see that all the mediators in these diagrams are the Higgs, uh, are the either scalar or pseudoscalar, that doesn't matter. And on the right-hand side of this, uh, of this slide in the box, you have similar kind of final states, but that come out of direct production of the supersymmetric particles themselves, okay? So not only that you will have standard model backgrounds for your uh, Higgs decays to supersymmetric final states that you will always get in any mono X search, but you will also have to account potentially 
for the backgrounds which are coming from the direct production of supersymmetry itself. And we did that because we really wanted to target this specific Higgs DK mode, uh, which is very, very different than this uh, supersymmetric mediated, uh, sorry, standard model mediated supersymmetric production that sort of I've shown on the right hand side of the slide. Okay. So from here on throughout the talk, I refer to as signal the Higgs mediator SUSY production, and I refer to as direct or I refer to as backgrounds or SUSY backgrounds, uh, uh, the SUSY, direct SUSY production, which is on the right hand side. Okay, so every time I send signal, I talk about the Higgs mediated production. Every time I talk about SUSY backgrounds, I talk about direct SUSY production. One is the left hand side, the other one is right hand side. Okay, so then we can look at the kinematics because that's what we want to look at in order to optimize the signal. So here I show you the signal kinematics for quite a few different uh, benchmark models and quite a few different uh, variables which you can exploit. So the classic variables you can exploit are of course missing energy. You can also exploit the delta R of the two leptons. In the case, the C is decaying to leptonic final states. Uh, you can exploit what is the, the classic LT variable, or you can also exploit this chi, which is basically momentum imbalance of the dilepton final state and the missing energy in your signal. What you see on the plots, all of these, is basically different benchmark points, which correspond to different masses of the LSP uh, and the NLSP, uh, with a fixed mass of the heavy Higgs at 800 GeV. The dashed lines are when the, these SUSY particles are produced directly, and the solid lines are when they are produced via uh, the Higgs mediated signal that I'm interested. So you already see that all these kinematic distributions, if you just compare the dashed with the solid lines, you see that all these different production mechanisms actually lead to very different kind of kinematics in your, in your uh, signal as compared to the backgrounds of supersymmetry. And therefore you can actually optimize your search to look for such kind of production mechanisms much nicely, also discriminating over the supersymmetric backgrounds. So we did what everybody would do. We put a few benchmark points and optimized for our analysis. For completeness, I show you here two different benchmark points that differ from each other in the context of the masses of the mediator. So one has a 650 GeV, the other one has a 700 GeV or so. Uh, they also have slightly different masses of your charginos and the neutralinos in the final state. The rest of the details are not very important. Now with this, you can now start to optimize for uh, analysis and different final states. So here I show you dilepton plus missing energy. And in particular, what we also checked is all to, 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 to understand whether uh, producing the Higgs at next to leading order instead of leading order Monte Carlos will make any difference to our analysis. So that is why this plot looks very, very busy because we have different Higgs production modes we have different SUSY backgrounds and we have different standard model backgrounds. The details again are not very important as it is important to realize if you, for example, let's just look at the plot, the plot on the top left, you have a solid line, which is what you would have as a usual discriminant between, um, uh, sorry, if you look at the dotted line, you see that the usual discriminant between the supersymmetry and the standard model uh, final states. Uh, but if you are looking for the signal that we are interested in, you can actually tighten the cut a lot and you can specifically look for Higgs production by means of uh, re-optimizing your analysis, by means of reusing, uh, 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 tightening your cuts in order to really um, check for the kinematic differences that are concentrated in one specific region of parameter space. So if you do that, uh, we did it for uh, both the benchmark points. We have basically details of the analysis that I show you here. In particular, what helps is to have a, a veto of the B jets in the B veto category, which is when the gluon gluon production is targeted and the beta category, you at least need one B jet because that is when you're targeting the additional B jet in the signal. You can look for basically uh, invariant masses of the dilepton. You can look for, uh, this is basically a low hydronic activity scenario. So you, <clears throat> you will reject any light jets in your, in your signal. 
And then in addition, what I was telling you is that you can also look for the delta R between the tie lepton signals or delta phi between the tie lepton and the missing energy, the missing energy itself and this momentum imbalance variable, right? So all these things in, all together actually give you a rather large uh, sig signal significances going at high uh, scale, which is what I've shown you on the slide, which uh, on the table, which is on the bottom left of the slide. Okay, so you have two different benchmark scenarios. We did it in the both categories, BV2 and VTAC. BV2 roughly corresponds to gluon gluon production, VTAC corresponds to BBH production. Okay, so you see when you exploit the additional B tagging of the categories, you actually start to gain more signal, uh, more, uh, more sensitivity to your signal. Okay, so just to put a caveat, no systematics have been considered here. I'll briefly comment on the, on the issue of system, systematics. Uh, you can also do similar thing for the BB plus MET final state. And I think I'm going to run out of time if I go through the entire thing in detail, but you get the idea. The, the, the analysis is very similar. Uh, you re-optimize your cut. You try to find out which parameter space uh, you can tighten your cuts uh, going beyond just the discrimination between standard model and SUSE uh, production. And uh, therefore you can get better sensitivity in uh, BB bar plus my final state as well. Okay. So here also you have the table on the bottom right, sorry, bottom left, which shows you the signal significances for two different benchmark points we have considered. Okay. Uh, Briefly, what I also wanted to very nicely mention, uh, which was a, a thing that in fact, I also learned uh, in this analysis is typically in order to reduce TT bar backgrounds, we tend to veto, B, uh, veto B jets. And therefore we think that just vetoing B jets actually will lead uh, to reduction of TT bar backgrounds. This is not always true because we found scenarios where actually uh, many times the, the, the C quarks would fake as a B jet in the hydronic decays of the W bosons, which originate from the bottom, for example, uh, from, the, from the W decays. Uh, and uh, these kinds of decays uh, would actually not lead to a significant reduction in the background. Okay, so the way we had to do it was to, to identify the second jet that comes out of W. Uh, which is to say that there has to be a light jet around the faked B jet and therefore uh, devise a new strategy in order to use that as a discriminant. So this is one of the cases which I really like because this is one place where going forward, improving on the B tagging cap capabilities has actually give us control on reducing the TT bar background. And this would be important when we are looking for non-standard signatures like this. Okay. You can do similar things also for the diphoton final state. Uh, again, I have given you for completeness uh, the exact selections that we did and the analysis that we carried out. The B tagging here also helps, as you see on the table again on the bottom left of the slide. Uh, however, uh, this low, low branching ratio of Higgs to gamma gamma is a, a killer for this analysis, but it's a very clean channel potential to design better, more advanced analysis, which is something that we did not spend a lot of time on, but that's also a potentially interesting channel. After all, we did discover Higgs in the gamma gamma final state. And that was one of the first nicest things that we observed. Okay, so briefly to comment on the signal systematics, uh, as I said, um, if we look at the significances in all different categories that I briefly mentioned, you see that the significances are very high. However, if you actually account for signal significances with five or 10% systematics, which is what I show you on the two columns on the right-hand side of this table, you do see that, uh, that you know, the expected significances uh, differ from what we have done in our analysis. Um, and therefore, potential, first of all, that, that tells us that, okay, we are not going to see a 10 sigma at high luminosity LHC that we've missed now at this stage. That is, this 10 sigma is, uh, is a little bit of an artifact also of the significances. Uh, and secondly, it also shows you that taking into account the systematics is, is also a very important thing in the analysis that you would consider. Okay, very good. So I have five more minutes or so, and uh, is that correct? Can somebody tell me how much time do I have? Yeah, 
Okay, we minutes. started a bit uh, late, but we have to have the question answer session also. Yes. So, you so I'll I'll take five more minutes or yeah, so, and I'll it. briefly mention uh, yeah. this uh, this thing that we are currently uh, working on, which is the which is the 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 idea of finding long-lived particles in the NMS system. Okay. So the the interesting possibility here is to contrast what I'm going to talk about with the MSSM. In the MSSM, there is no possibility to obtain a long-lived neutral electrovicino. Okay, the neutralino two, three, four in the MSSM are almost always promptly decaying particles because they all have gauge. Uh, basically, they they all have gauge admixtures, and therefore the couplings are really strong. They just decay. That's it. The NMSSM, which is the extension of the MSSM, features an additional state, which is the signalino, and it features an additional couplings. So you can think about constructing a scenario where the signalino is the LSP and is very weakly coupled to the rest of the MSSM spectrum, okay, the rest of the electroweak emails. So if the signalino is the LSP, all the other electroweak, you know, neutral, you know, two, three, four, would like to decay to this signalino. But because it is a very weakly coupled particle, the decays will live, lead to a long-lived final state. Okay, so this is a simple uh, sort of, uh, this is sort of the, the crux of the observation, so to say, and that leads to long-lived neutralinos in the MS, in the NMSSM, which are usually not possible in the MSSM scenarios. Okay, so I have some details of how you can obtain such kinds of long-lived final states. The crux of the story that you have to remember is you have to sort of go into the region where the lambda, which is a, which is one of the three parameters introduced in the NMSSM context is much small that leads to a single no LSP and also leads to uh, basically a very weakly coupled scenario, okay? So if you go into such kinds of regime, uh, I show you on the slide here, the kind of spectrum that you can obtain in the neutral Lino sector. So you have a single no LSP order of hundreds of GeV, you have a B order 200, 300 GeV, then you get Higgs Enos, which are almost mass degenerate 5, 600 GeV. And you get a Vino, which is very decoupled, greater than a TV or so, okay? And if such kind of parameter space is constructed, I also show you here on the top left, sorry, top right, the corresponding decay weights, and you do see actually that uh, you get long-lived neutralino two, just as you would expect, because what I have explained, while still keeping a reasonable mass difference between the neutralino two and the neutralino one, which means that you get hard, final states in the supersymmetric parameter space instead of the soft displaced final states that we've been looking for. Okay, so how you can go looking for it? Uh, this leads to a very long cascade decays because the way the production mechanisms here work, I show you the, the, the production diagram of one such possibility where you have a production of neutral into three, four associated with the church, you know, and then you get a long cascade decay that basically leads to multi B and a lepton in the final state. The lepton in the final state is hard. Uh, this will give you a possibility to trigger on. And you see also on the bottom right of the slide, uh, you show the, the production cross-section of these final states. Uh, they are A, significant so that you can do the analysis and B, they just decrease with the mass of the heavier neutralinos, which is what you would expect uh, going and in, the, in the production uh, mechanisms. Okay, uh, you can look at the signal characteristics as usual. You will see a long decay length. You will see the effect of the boost in the lab. And now you can do uh, an analysis. Uh, the main problem you have to look at is the background. The main background is coming from TT bar. And the, the, the most interesting way you can reduce it is just to impose a cut on the impact parameter. And if you do that, uh, then you can almost go into a background free limit, at least considering TT bar as the prominent background. Okay. So what that, this is what we've done so far. We have basically looked at uh, this scenario, looked at the effect of the TT bar backgrounds, looked at the effect of the impact parameters, uh, used missing energy and uh, PT of the lepton as a sort of trigger strategies, and basically constructed an analysis that just looks for multiple displaced tracks that are coming from a displaced vertex. And uh, if you do that, uh, together with a uh, reasonable impact parameter. Uh, as, as I show on the table here, we have actually managed to reduce the background 
to almost zero. So you can actually do this analysis in an almost background free limit up to experimental artifacts that you will have to worry about. Okay, so that brings me to my conclusion. I'm going to leave the slide on in the, in the interest of time and I'll take the questions. Thank you very much. And I'm sorry for the delay. Thank you, Sujita, for the interesting talk. No, it, uh, I think it's okay because uh, we started the session a bit late. Questions, please. Okay, there is one hand, uh, Camellia. Hi, uh, I have a question. So why do the systematics impact uh, B veto more than the B tech? Um, is yes okay so yes i think i think the reason for why we had more of an impact of systematics on we wait or let me remember now uh, yes a was because this particular uh, category b veto for the for the analysis that we had started with already had a lesser cross section than the beta category so we already started with something which had a smaller cross section. And then if you add in addition, uh, the, the fact that, you know, you don't know your backgrounds very well, that affects it more than the fact that you already have a lot of cross section uh, to, 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 to deal with. Does that make sense? Uh, okay. Yeah. Satyaki. Hello, am I audible? Yes. yes. Okay, hello Suchita. Um, I uh, I have two questions. Uh, one, uh, well, first I uh, I just wanted to uh, look at the uh, there's one scatter plot uh, where you said that the message is in what scenario what Suzy scenario you can expect met plus uh, met plus x signal. That's probably slide seven. Yes. Um, could you uh, could you emphasize once again uh, what what are we seeing here? This yes. is standard. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. okay. Good. So let me spend that some time on this, right? Okay. First of all, why would you make this plot? <laughs> because it's a very busy plot. It just it's it's hard on the eyes. It takes time to understand. But there are good reasons to make it. Okay. So let's look at this slide for a moment, right? So as I, as I showed you on, uh, on this slide, you have two different production mechanisms. You have different decay modes of the Higgs to neutralino one and a neutralino two. You have different decay modes of neutralino two and three, which could be Z, a Higgs or whatever that comes out of your PMSSM parameter space. So if you do this by hand, you're going to take eternity classifying the parameter space as it is. And we didn't want to do that. We wanted to get a global overview of what are the interesting final states to target. And therefore we said, well, let's just classify all possible VK modes of heavy Higgs to SUSY production. And also, and also the production, the DK of the SUSY themselves. And come, let, let's look at what comes out of it. And this is what you see on this plot. So what we've done here is we've taken the Atlas ATV PMSSM parameter space. I know this is old, but the paper came out in 2017 or so. So the paper itself is also very old. So, but the message stays. We took the Atlas ATV PMSSM parameter space. We took all the points which were allowed at the, at the time. So all those points here are allowed, were allowed at ATV. Okay. We took those and we, we looked at the Higgs production and the DK finals uh, and the DKs of those. Then we said, well, does will these Higgs production uh, or in particular the DKs of the SUSY change if you look at Beno like LSP or Higgsino like LSP? And therefore, you see two different scenarios where uh, either the LSP, which is the neutral Eno one in this case, is a Beno like or it is Higgsino like. And then we look at, we classify the DK modes of, of uh, Higgs going to neutral in a one and, or Higgs going to neutral in a I, neutral in a J, and either of the neutral in those decay to something else. Each of the dot, the colored dot is a different final state. So the way you read it, let's just concentrate on the right, left-hand side of this. The way you read it is if you look at the, the, the first violet point, 
it shows you inf inf, which means that the decay of the Higgs on both the legs leads to an invisible final state. The cyan points tell you that one leg is invisible while the other leg has two jets plus invisible. We don't, we don't write the plus invisible for space reasons. The green point tells you that it's an invisible plus a Z plus invisible, Higgs plus invisible, and so on and so forth. So if you compare both the left and the right hand side plots, you see that you know the relative ordering would change and so on and so forth. But roughly speaking, you always get this Bono X kind of final stage where you have Higgs plus invisible, Z plus invisible, W plus invisible kind of scenarios. Does that make sense? Yes, thanks. And I, I was looking at the plot. So then uh, from the left plot, uh, the main message is that so the orange one is mm -hmm. Z jet, 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 jet. So that is, that's like a mono jet signal. And no, this, this would be a multi jet plus MET plus Z signal. <laughs> Multi-jet plus MET plus Z, Z signal, okay. Right, because and, you have four, uh, four jets, you have a Z, and then you have the missing energy, and anyway, that comes for free. Yeah, okay, okay. And uh, and the, uh, I see the red dots um, more or less scattered all over the, they have a, uh, they have a big overlap with the with the orange one and uh, mm -hmm. and the red dots. So th that indicates that uh, that much parameter space is available for mono Higgs. Exactly. The red dot. Okay. Exactly. Okay. And then, yeah. Um, and if I'm allowed, one more quick question on a different slide. Uh, so you you made a comment about uh, mono Higgs with Higgs to gamma gamma, mm -hmm. and um, both CMS and Atlas have studied this. Uh, CMS earlier studies indicate that gamma gamma alone does not give us uh, very much. So this is always done uh, together with WWZZ, Tau Tau, these mm -hmm. modes are also looked at and um, Tau Tau, Gamma Gamma, we published together, if I remember correctly. And um, Gamma Gamma does not give much additional handle, although we are looking at it. Mm -hmm. um, so can you, can you comment a bit more on what are the hopeful regions for gamma gamma that, that you have found in your study? Ah, okay. So the, the, the thing that, that uh, I, I think we don't have, uh, I don't have the kinematic plots for the gamma gamma. The, the, the point, right, that, that, that I wanted to emphasize here is the fact, so let's look at this slide, right? So let's take any diagram on the left-hand side of this slide. I look at gluon, gluon fusion, doesn't matter. That's technical details. The point of the story here is that you have a Higgs or, or a, you know, a heavy Higgs or a, or a pseudo-scalar Higgs, which is on shell that is re leading to a production of neutralino two, neutralino one system. And this on shellness of the mediator should leave an impact on the kinematics of the signal. Which is not the case. If you think about standard model mediators, your Zs or the Ws are never on shell. So they don't have a specific kinematic imprint on the final states, which you can get if you have the Higgs or the pseudoscalar as the mediator in your scenarios. So the, the, that is the reason for why we looked at gamma gamma, even though I agree with you, you know, it's expected not to be very interesting. But the question is, can you actually exploit the resonance of your signal in order to gain additional sensitivity, which we may not have done before? So that, that was the whole point of doing this analysis. And uh, as I said, in gamma gamma here, for example, uh, we did not sort of spend too much time doing uh, advanced uh, uh, methods. Uh, but what we got also is what, what you say here is not very high significances for the signal with the simplistic analysis that we've done. We have also done this for the two benchmark points only that we have chosen. Um, I have not given uh, much more thought to this final state after this, but I think this would be something very important, very interesting to look at going forward, specifically keeping in mind the, the fact that you have a resonance in the signal. So not exactly an answer to your question, but I hope some direction. Thank you. Thank you.
Okay, I don't see anybody else asking any other question. So let's thank uh, Suchita for the very interesting uh, talk.